So um, what I will describe are uh, a set of studies that focus on a transcription factor called MITF, which is thought to be the central transcriptional regulator in the development of the melanocyte lineage and also in the maintenance of the melanocyte lineage. Um, it's a unique factor because it is required not only for differentiation, which in the melanocyte lineage means pigment production, but also viability, proliferation, survival of, of the melanocyte. Um, and that's known on the basis of the first mutant allele that was detected and, and first called actually microphthalmia. Uh, it was a mouse that uh, spontaneously arose in a mouse colony back in the 1940s when coat color was one of the easy phenotypes to monitor. Um, and as you can see, the, the mouse in the center there is white, and it's white because it has no viable melanocytes. Um, this is not a, a mouse suffering from albinism. Albinism would be a condition where all the melanocytes are viable, but there's no pigment being synthesized. The pigment machinery would be disabled for some reason. Here, the, the defect is more fundamental. And um, heterozygous mutations in MITF occur in humans with Wardenberg syndrome type 2a. Um, mutations in MITF affecting pigmentation have been identified in virtually every organism that has pigment cells. Um, not only mammals, fish, birds, uh, there's apparently a Drosophila paralog. Um, so this is a, a very broad evolutionary factor, um, and it happens to singularly regulate so much that is of importance in the melanocyte lineage. Um, we know a huge amount about the biochemistry of MITF. My lab and, and a number around the world have studied this factor. So biochemically, to give a, a little bit of background, um, MITF is a member of the transcription factor family known as the basic helix, loop helix, leucine zipper family, um, as shown down here at the lower left. Um, the most famous member of this family is the MYC oncoprotein and, and the set of MYC family members. Um, they bind DNA as obligate heterodimers with MAX, and the crystal structure of MAX binding to DNA was solved back in the early 1990s. Um, here on the horizontal axis is the double strand of DNA, double stranded DNA, and um, 90 degrees uh, perpendicular to that, you can see the homodimer of MAX or homodimers of MITF, um, or the three other members of this more selected family that MITF belongs to, MITF, TFEB, TFE3, or TFEC. Um, this is a little subfamily that we have termed the MIT family mostly because I was doing my postdoc at MIT at the time. Um, but in fact, this subset of factors uh, contains several human oncogenes that I'll touch on a little bit later. And the DNA binding specificity of these factors recognizes either the perfect palindromic sequence, CAC, GTG, or a near palindrome where a single cytosine to thymidine variant exists, CAT, GTG. Both of these occur throughout the genome. Um, we and many other labs are looking very systematically at all the sites in the genome that are recognized by this, the genes that they target um, to transcriptionally control the programs that are very important downstream of these factors. In melanocytes, the first set of validated targets that we identified turned, to, turned out to be the entire pigmentation machinery. Every pigment enzyme, virtually every melanosomal factor, the export machinery, um, the, the richness of the transcriptional targets that MITF regulates in control of pigmentation is so robust that we actually identified a new albinism gene on the basis of first identifying that it was a transcriptional target of MITF, turned out to be a melanosomal factor. We also discovered early on that MITF, unlike many of the pigment genes whose expression is frequent um, but not always maintained within melanoma, um, MITF is nearly almost maintained within melanoma, and we assumed this would be the case because it's involved in viability. Pigment genes are not involved in viability. And on that basis, we made a monoclonal antibody quite a few years ago, um, which has now become a relatively standard diagnostic reagent in, in uh, dermatopathologic diagnosis of, of cutaneous pigmented lesions, or as shown on this slide, even unpigmented amelanotic melanomas down in the right lower box, um, you can see with a, a classic pigment uh, marker, HMB45, one of the most commonly used markers for melanoma that fails to 
uh, stain in the specimen, the, the box on the upper right shows that MITF remains positive. And, and this um, fits the likelihood that MITF as a viability factor is not as easy for melanoma cells to dispense with. Um, we know a huge amount now also about signaling pathways that modulate MITF. And I'll briefly review some of these because they have interesting aspects to the identification of, of humans at higher or lower risk of developing melanoma, and also integration of MITF within pathways that are well known to be oncogenic in melanoma. So shown here is the cyclic AMP regulated pathway um, in which the hormone melanocyte stimulating hormone, MSH, stimulates, binds, and stimulates its receptor, known as the melanocortin-1 receptor. Um, this is a G-protein-coupled receptor. It upregulates cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP stimulates the activity of two transcription factors, CREB1 or ATF1. They bind the MITF promoter, upregulate MITF, and pigmentation ensues. Um, this is uh, an important pathway in pigmentation. Um, it is suppressed by a natural antagonist of MSH known as the agouti protein. And it turns out that variant forms of that MSH receptor, the melanocortin-1 receptor, um, are common in human populations. Undoubtedly, they're highly, it's highly polymorphic even among those sitting in this room today. Redheads, um, in virtually all cases, have variant forms of that receptor that are unable to signal in response to MSH binding. Um, and there are, as I say, are hundreds of variants that, that signal to varying degrees in response to MSH. I'll come back later because redheads also represent the pigment variant in human populations that has the very highest risk of developing melanoma. And we think this is interesting and important. We'd like to understand what that's teaching us. Another signaling pathway that impinges on MITF, not in controlling its expression at the genomic level, but its activity post-translationally, is the MAP kinase pathway. And what's shown here um, is the MAP kinase pathway as activated by CKIT receptor or its ligand stem cell factor. Um, undoubtedly, many other activators, receptor tyrosine kinase pathways that activate the MAP kinase pathway will also impinge on MITF. And here, through all the mediators of MAP kinase pathway signaling, eventually RAS components, BRAF, CRAF, um, MEC, ERK, et cetera, what converges eventually on MITF is the direct phosphorylation of MITF on several sites by ERK, um, also by RISC. And the consequence of this phosphorylation is complex. It's very robust. It happens within seconds of stimulating a melanocyte with a receptor tyrosine kinase ligand. But when MITF is phosphorylated by ERK, it immediately recruits P300, a co-activator that stimulates transcription of target genes. However, simultaneous with that, the same phosphorylation targets MITF for ubiquitination and proteolysis. So simultaneously, the protein is activated and it becomes highly short-lived. In fact, while this is a sort of a complicated stimulation and repression of MITF activity, it's often the type of red flag that you're looking at something that is potent and biologically perhaps dangerous. And, and so in some contexts, you may see MITF as an amplified oncogene. In other contexts, as a suppressed target of the MAP kinase pathway, also an oncogenic, an oncogenic pathway in melanoma. MITF is also subject to a modification by the sumopeptide. This um, carries some homology to ubiquitination. The activity of sumylation was sort of a curiosity that a graduate student found in the lab until a couple of years ago when we discovered that a mutation exists, as I'll show you in a second, um, at the consensus site for that sumo modification. Um, and this represents a point mutation seen in familial melanoma. It's been described now. We had a, a publication in Nature about a year and a half ago. Um, it was discovered subsequently in Europe, Australia, US, um, throughout the world. Exactly the same mutation, blocks sumoylation, therefore hyperactivates MITF function. Um, so this pathway obviously is, is chock full of melanoma oncogenes in RAS, BRAF, CKIT is mutated in mucosal and acral melanomas, and MITF itself, either by genomic amplification, as Keith pointed out, or by these, this specific recurring point mutation that exists in familial melanoma, and occasionally um, in sporadic melanoma. Here is the, the discovery 
um, that Levi carried out uh, when he was a postdoc. We collaborated with him and Bill Sellers a number of years ago, identifying the genomic amplification of MITF in melanomas. Um, this is uh, the first pedigree of, of famil a big uh, pedigree in, actually this is two families here. This was originally in Australia. Um, the affected individuals with melanoma are, are replete, many, many affected individuals. Um, the specific site that was variant in these people um, blocked the ability of MITF to receive the SUMO modification, and the consequence is a very slight hyperactivation. Um, these people have a significantly elevated risk of melanoma, in fact, an elevated risk of developing multiple primaries of melanoma. So um, I will very quickly touch on this pathway because Keith showed, in fact, even a couple of the same figures that I put in the next two slides or so. But this has to do with the question of how MITF might regulate the expression of proteins that now are believed to be antigens in the immune response, in the examples of successful immune response against melanoma in, in patients receiving immunotherapy. By and large, it's been identified that melanocytic proteins, frequently pigment proteins, are targets of successful immunotherapy. And in fact, with ipilimumab, one of the signals of a successful immunotherapeutic response can be the development of vitiligo within these patients. Um, obviously, there must be a lineage-specific factor, and the pigment proteins have been identified as such antigens. By no means they're the full spectrum to explain them, as far as we know, but they're there. Um, and so here is this pathway, and what would happen if you block the MAP kinase pathway? For a B BRAF mutant melanoma, it would be a BRAF inhibitor, might be a MEK inhibitor, maybe a combination. Well, because of this convergence on MITF, we know that with preventing the phosphorylation of MITF, one would be preventing ubiquitination and thereby proteolysis, degradation of MITF. So the protein would accumulate, and so would its target genes. And among these target genes might be these antigens. And that's exactly what Jen Wargo and Keith found. Um, and these are some of the same uh, graphs that he, he just showed you in, the, in his slides a couple of minutes ago. So within patient specimens, one can see at the RNA level or by staining immunohistochemically um, that within a very short time of receiving these various BRAF inhibitors, um, there is upregulation of antigen expression of, of the classes of antigens that are known to be targeted um, in patients who are receiving successful immunotherapy for melanoma. And synchronously with this, there is a recognition of CD8 positive T cell infiltrates within the same tumors. This was an interesting example um, of a patient uh, whose uh, pretreatment um, tumor specimen is studied all the way to the left. Um, and the expression of these melanocytic antigens is low, then un under BRAF-I, so the, the group here, um, the second set of four, you can see that on therapy, all of these antigens were upright, three of the four actually were very profoundly upregulated, but then the patient progressed, and at the time of progression, expression of these antigens was once again very low. But then the patient was put on a BRAF-MEC combination and had another response, and in the on therapy biopsy, once again showed up regulation of these melanocyte, of three of the four melanocytic antigens. And down at the bottom, it, there was a corresponding uh, CD8 positive T cell infiltrate in each case. And all this smells of an interaction between signaling and signaling inhibitors on the one hand and, um, and, and the ability of T cells to be responding. Obviously, the effector function of those T cells is not proven by these studies. So, a huge question that, that is unfortunately reiterated constantly when we look at the waterfall plots and we look at patients responding to the targeted therapy strategies is a separate question from what causes acquired resistance, what causes relapse. Because as oncologists, what we really know is that the best chance of being cured isn't at the time of relapse, it's at the time of initial therapy. And looking at these patients, the vast majority of patients are not having complete remissions. And the fact is that without a complete remission, in the vast majority of cases, our therapy will fail. So if we have a BRAF-addicted tumor, if BRAF is the engine driving this tumor, and we have a fantastic drug, set of drugs, we can layer them with antagonists further downstream the pathway. We can turn the pathway almost completely off and measure that. A tiny fraction of patients will have a complete remission. What are we missing? So we believe that understanding the acute response carries some very important information on 
the wiring of the cell and also opportunities to try and improve therapeutic efficacy up front. So one way that we have looked at this, and I'll tell you a couple of vignettes, is to ask the question of what controls the acute response from the perspective of apoptotic regulation. So cell death, obviously there are many mechanisms of death, and one of them is apoptosis. Apoptosis is particularly interesting to the melanocyte lineage because there are certain knockout models where the mice turn white, and we, know, we look at that and pay attention to what's going on in their melanocytes, and so there are, there are clues of interesting regulatory circuitry involving the apoptotic machinery in the, in the melanocyte. And so here was a simple bioinformatic analysis we carried out in which we looked at the expression of all the anti-apoptotic members of the BCL2 family, the, the famous apoptosis regulating family. And, and the group of, of uh, this heat map, the second cluster down at the bottom shows that their expression across the NCI60 cancer cell line, just as a very simple uh, expression analysis, is pretty uniformly distributed. There's nothing particularly striking about melanoma, which is the, the, the set of tumors all the way to the left. Um, up at the top, um, the, second, the second row is the expression of MITF across these tumors, and MITF is highly restricted to melanoma. As you can see, the red, uh, the red boxes are all the way to the left and segregate just in the melanomas. Um, but there is one member of the BCL2 family, a, a factor named BCL2A1, which segregates very closely with MITF and was strikingly absent in the vast majority of non-melanoma tumors. And when that happens, being very MITF centric in our thinking, we wonder if MITF may regulate it, may it have a, a functionally important role in the lineage. And so we studied this, uh, there are many melanoma cell lines, we can knock down the expression of MITF, and as shown in the middle row here of, of these graphs, if we knock down MITF expression, the expression of BCL2A1 plummets. Um, if we, in the, in the bottom two graphs, if we stimulate a melanoma cell or a melanocyte with a cyclic AMP agonist, you recall that cyclic AMP is the, is the MSH pathway, melanocyte stimulating hormone. This is how MITF expression is turned on. What we see is very shortly MITF expression goes up, as in the red bar, and then the indirect targets of MITF, like pigment genes, go up in a second wave, just the kind of kinetics you would expect in the context of a real signaling pathway. And so the graph on the lower right shows that after cyclic AMP signaling, BCL2A1 indeed goes up, and it goes up with the kinetics as an indirect target of cyclic AMP, and we know that this is through MITF, because if we block MITF, cyclic AMP cannot upregulate BCL2A1 expression. So we learned a lot about BCL2A1 knocking it down and so on, but one of the striking findings was that the locus, the genomic locus encoding BCL2A1 is genomically amplified in about a third of, of melanomas. Um, and in, not in every single case is it a very focal amplification. One of the problems in, in, uh, in analyzing genomic uh, copy number variability within cancer is that uh, it is most meaningful, it's most possible to draw a conclusion about functionality if it's a highly focal amplification. If you have one gene in the amplicon, what else could it be? Well, in fact, there are other things it could be. But if you have larger amplicons, you're really stuck. It's not a smoking gun. It's not like having a point mutation. Um, in this case, we believe BCL2A1, despite the fact that the amplicons are not highly focal, is probably playing a biologically functional role, because in some cases it is focal. In other cases, MITF is amplified and BCL2A1 is correspondingly upregulated even if its own locus is not um, specifically amplified itself. So we could see that BCL2A1 plays an active role in preventing BRAF inhibition from inducing apoptosis. Um, in most of the early studies, and, and I think most people would, would still agree this uh, in, to this day, when we take melanoma cells with a BRAF inhibitor in vitro and we add a BRAF inhibitor, um, it is primarily a static drug. It is not a sidle drug. If you leave it for three, four days, they will gradually conk out, and eventually, of course, they will die. The inhibition of the MAP kinase pathway upon adding a BRAF inhibitor is pretty much complete within one minute, and it takes three days for the cells to die to an appreciable extent. So there appear to be circuitries that are preventing these cells from undergoing an apoptotic response to inhibition of BRAF. So here were examples where we knocked down BCL2A1 and saw that this strongly suppressed the ability of a BRAF mutant melanoma to grow um, in vivo. 
Um, we measured BCL2A1 expression in RNA specimens, pretreatment RNA specimens for patients, and saw that higher levels of BCL2A1 predict a poorer clinical response. And using a tool compound, a beta-clax, which is shown at the lower right, um, a beta-clax, unfortunately, is not a selective BCL2A1 inhibitor but it is a non-selective inhibitor that does target BCL2A1 as well as other members, anti-apoptotic members of the BCL2 family. Um, but it does appear to give at least additive or super additive, additive efficacy in combination with BRAF inhibitor. Um, fortunately, there are some BCL2A1 tool compounds and, and some interest in pharma to be developing selective inhibitors. Um, and we think that this could potentially be an area where the acute response to BRAF inhibition in melanoma might be enhanced. Another way to look at the consequences of BRAF inhibition in melanoma early, acutely, is to ask what is the transcriptional response to BRAF inhibition? And my lab loves to mine the data that other people have gone to enormous pains and expenses to generate. And so we did that, and this was a, a data set that Neil Rosen at Sloan Kettering published recently, um, in which he looked at the, the, the app, by Affymetrix array, the, the RNA expression profiling, comparing before and after treatment with a BRAF inhibitor. And when we did pathway analysis of this, the pathway that rose to the top was the pathway of oxidative phosphorylation and mitochondrial metabolism. So there was a major shift upon treating a melanoma cell with a BRAF inhibitor away from glycolysis towards mitochondrial respiration, oxidative phosphorylation. And you can see in all the graphs at the top that there is a shift from the black curve um, going from lower to higher upon treatment with a BRAF inhibitor, except the one right in the center, the MIWO cell line, because that one actually does not have a BRAF mutation, so it doesn't respond to a BRAF inhibitor. But in all other cases, a variety of markers of OXFAS um, indicate that there is a metabolic shift, and, and in fact, this magnitude of metabolic shift is major. This is a, this is a significant shift in the metabolism. Um, in the electron micrographs in the lower left, um, there actually is a massive amplification in the number of mitochondria that are actually formed. Um, if you wait a day or several days, mitochondrial proliferation actually occurs within the melanoma cells. And correspondingly, if one measures lactate, um, that is to say glycolysis, um, not only has oxfos increased, but glycolysis and glycolytic uh, metabolism has diminished, all within moments of treating a melanoma cell with a BRAF inhibitor. What regulates this? Well, there is a master transcriptional regulator of mitochondrial biogenesis. And this is a factor known as PGC1-alpha. And we looked at PGC1-alpha and noticed that within melanoma cells, treatment with either a BRAF inhibitor or a MEK inhibitor, in fact, treatment with an NRAS mutant melanoma with a MEK inhibitor would do the same thing, which is to very rapidly and profoundly upregulate the expression of PGC1-alpha. Interestingly, if we took BRAF mutant colon cancer cells, BRAF is mutant in about 15% of colon cancers, we did not see this effect. PGC1-alpha did not change. So it suggested to us a melanocyte selective mechanism through which MAP kinase activity is upregulating or is controlling PGC1-alpha and mitochondrial biogenesis. And when we think of melanocyte-specific factors downstream of the MAP kinase pathway, MITF again pops into our minds. So, and, and here are specimens from patients on BRAF inhibitor, again, showing upregulation of PGC1-alpha. So it turned out that MITF, in fact, as I showed before, is strongly induced upon BRAF inhibitor treatment, and PGC1-alpha is strongly induced as well. And that upregulation is mediated by the stabilization and upregulation of MITF expression. I'll spare you the, the promoter bashing, chromatin immunoprecipitation, luciferase assays, et cetera. Suffice it to say that MITF is mediating a profound and very rapid shift in PGC1-alpha expression, followed by mitochondrial respiration and a shift from glycolysis to OXFAS. So who cares? Does this matter? Does it functionally do anything to the cell. And of course, metabolism is a very important thing. I think you heard yesterday some aspects of this, and its, its interface with, uh, with cancer biology in general is, is in the process of exploding at multiple levels. So what we basically found is that PGC1-alpha overexpression is, in fact, protective against BRAF inhibition, whereas antagonism of oxidative phosphorylation 
in fact sensitizes melanoma cells to BRAF inhibition. And here are some of the graphs that show that. So in the top row where PGC1-alpha has been forcibly overexpressed, what we see is that the ability of BRAF inhibitor to kill is blunted significantly in three different melanoma lines. Whereas at the bottom, we took three different mitochondrial toxins. The drug at the left, 2,4-D and dinitrophenol, is actually a diet pill. Um, and it, it, used, it was used in the 30s and 40s as a, uh, as a way to burn off, you know, by, it's a mitochondrial uncoupler. Um, so, and, and what you can see is that in each of these cases, the, the melanoma cells have become hypersensitive um, to the combination of BRF inhibition where oxidative metabolism has been inhibited by these small molecules. So we think that there is a, an opportunity to exploit this um, in a manner which is not necessarily killing all of your mitochondria, but even just tweaking them at the time of BRAF inhibitor therapy as a, as a combination approach. I want to take a moment and touch on some tumors that are not melanoma, but which we believe are linked to the transcriptional machinery that MITF or its family members, that MIT family, is regulating. Because there's some tumors that are not famous tumors, they're not as common as melanoma, um, but nonetheless share underlying mechanism. And here is one that where we actually, when I was back working at Dana-Farber in pediatric oncology, this actually was a, a, a genomic translocation that we identified in a patient that I saw at the Jimmy Fund Clinic who had a translocation in which a housekeeping gene the alpha gene on chromosome 11 was fused to the promoter region, essentially replacing, it was not the promoter, but it was within intron 1, replacing in a promoter swap structure the upstream non-coding regions of TFEB, such that TFEB's expression was now dysregulated, but the sequence of the TFEB gene was unchanged. And the consequence, and you can see this in the fluorescence in situ hybridization on the right, is that you have one normal copy of TFEB, you have a probe on each end of the gene, and the other two are now sitting on completely different chromosomes. And so this was a, a translocation in which TFEB had become dysregulated, and subsequently this has been found in, in many other cases of tr what's called translocation-associated papillary renal carcinoma. Another tumor that shares dysregulated activity of an MIT family transcription factor is clear cell sarcoma. Clear cell sarcoma is a tumor that also used to be called melanoma of soft parts. Um, and it was called that because in a significant fraction of cases, it's a pigmented tumor. Although it is clearly a sarcoma, it is not a melanoma. And there is a pathognomonic translocation event in this tumor, and that translocation event fuses the Ewing sarcoma protein, EWS, to a transcription factor called ATF1. And I mentioned to you at the beginning of my talk that ATF1 is one of the two transcription factors that activates MITF expression in response to cyclic AMP signaling, in response to melanocyte stimulating hormone. So this translocation that occurs in all cases of clear cell sarcoma has removed, has swapped out the cyclic AMP responsive domain on ATF1 and swapped in instead a region of the EWS protein that confers constitutive activity to ATF1. And what we found is that this sarcoma inexplicably is making tons of MITF, as you can see in the stain on the right, and MITF correspondingly is inducing the production of melanin, mimicking, in a sense, melanocytic biology in a sarcoma. Here is an example where we knock down that EWS ATF1 pathognomonic oncogene. It kills the tumor, but if we supply MITF exogenously, it rescues the tumor back, suggesting that MITF is sufficient to explain the oncogenic activity of EWS ATF1. But more importantly, we also could rescue the growth of clear cell sarcoma cells by providing TFE3 or TFEB. Any member of this family could rescue the other. And we could do the reciprocal experiment taking papillary renal carcinoma cells where TFE3 had been translocated. And if we knocked down TFE3, the tumor couldn't grow. But if we supplied MITF, it would grow. So this family is redundant functionally um, and we believe shares targets. We now have evidence that PGC1-alpha is a direct transcriptional target, not only of MITF and melanoma, but also of TFEB and TFE3. And these are largely pediatric malignancies for which there is 
no successful therapy other than surgery. So we believe that this strategy of targeting oxidative phosphorylation, perhaps in combination with MEK inhibition, because so many of these tumors do have MAP kinase pathway overactivity, um, might become clinical strategies for, for these children um, who otherwise have so few options. And here's just a list of what these many tumors are. So perhaps we can cautiously begin to lump rather than just split among the various tumor types. So I want to take a few moments at the end of my talk to touch on some other projects that deal more with the genesis of melanoma. Where does it come from? And why is the incidence of melanoma climbing so steeply, in fact, more steeply than any other cancer in man? So we did a study in which we used a mouse model generated by Martin McMahon and Marcus Bosenberg several years ago. And in their mouse, I will spare you all the genetic engineering nuances of this, there is a capacity to treat topically with the drug tamoxifen and activate a swap from wild-type BRAF to mutant BRAF. And when you do that, the mouse develop moles. BRAF is the most common gene that is mutated in benign moles, or nevi, and almost none of those will ever do anything. They'll sit there. Um, most moles, most of us have these sitting on our body. They're benign, and they almost never progress. In the mice, they progress maybe 5% of the time or 10% of the time after a very, very long latency, but they also, by and large, are benign. In contrast, if they simultaneously activated BRAF and inactivated P10, or several other groups simultaneously in, in, inactivated INC4A or P53, now the two-hit gave 100% melanoma incidence within about eight weeks. So it was a two-hit cancer, one-hit benign lesion. We wondered, what is the impact of studying exactly this model on genetically redhead mice? Because black genetic background just isn't who gets melanoma. And so we introduced the BRAF allele into red mice and no second gene. So shown in the curves in blue and in black are mice that are either black or black albinos. Black being defined that their melanocortin receptor, the MSH receptor, is fully functional. And if they're albino, that just means the pigment pathway downstream is, is absent. So you can see they get very rare melanomas. They, they, get, they get moles, but they don't get melanomas. But if genetically redhead mice have activation of BRAF, about 50% of these mice develop melanoma. And they develop melanoma with a much shorter latency. And this was a very surprising observation because most of us had assumed the reason red-haired, fair-skinned people are at higher risk of melanoma is because they have poor UV shielding. But these mice never saw UV. We went into the animal room with a UV meter to be sure that there was no inexplicable UV, and there was none. So something about being genetically redhead was profoundly elevating the risk of developing melanoma after singly activating BRAF. So, and to confirm that these were really BRAF-driven, we treated with, with a BRAF inhibitor. These tumors would shrink, so they behaved like true BRAF-induced tumors. So how could it be that the red hair gene is conferring such a high risk of melanoma? What would it be doing? Well, this receptor regulates cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP regulates many, many pathways within the cell. One of them is pigment, and many others might DNA repair efficiency, apoptosis, cell cycle, all sorts of possibilities. Genetically, we could study the pigment piece by crossing into our redhead mice one of the albino genes so that we now have albino redheads. Okay, they're red by virtue of the melanocortin-1 receptor non-functioning, and they're albino by virtue of the first enzyme for, the pigment, for all pigment synthesis being mutated. And when we studied this, we found that having no pigment machinery prevented the incidence of melanoma in genetically red mice, which leads us to conclude that the red pigment is actually carcinogenic. The, the pigment or the pathway of synthesizing pheomelanin, red pigment, is actually contributing in combination with BRAF mutation to the formation of melanomas. And how might it be doing that? Well, there was early chemical evidence from the 60s that red pigment generates reactive oxygen species. And so we measured, in fact, nucleotide adducts that are known to be induced by peroxide treatment. It was originally studied in E. coli. And in collaboration with Yun Cheng Wang, who's a chemist at UC Irvine, he identified, you can see the red bar showing just the skin of a red mouse as compared to the skin of an albino red mouse. The red mice have much higher constitutive levels of nucleotide adducts that contain this cyclic species 
that essentially is, is an erroneous or a carcinogen-induced species. We also could see elevated lipid peroxidation within the skin of these mice. And so what this suggests, we think, is that there are opportunities to prevent melanoma beyond just sun protection, although sun protection is important and we believe it amplifies this effect, there probably is a baseline of carcinogenesis that is already encoded within the melanocytes of fair-skinned people. I'm going to end by telling a, a very quick story about the interface of UV signaling in the skin and behavior, which happens to impinge on many of the same things I was just talking about. So we found a number of years ago that the ability of ultraviolet radiation to induce pigmentation, popularly known as tanning pathway, is not a direct effect. UV does not directly stimulate melanocytes to make MITF and make pigment. It's indirect. The target of UV in the pigment response is actually keratinocytes. And the DNA damage in the keratinocyte nucleus responds in P53 upregulation, very well known. But what was new in our experiments is the observation that P53 turns on the gene pro-opiomelanocortin, which contains the melanocyte-stimulating hormone peptide, MSH. And then it is the release of that peptide that stimulates the redhead receptor and so on, and then the pigment pathway is that indirect effect. One thing that we noticed when we look carefully at pro-opiomelanocortin is that it also encodes beta-endorphin. And beta-endorphin smells of behavior, and it happens to be sitting in a place where, if this is true, it's happening every time we step outside. So this may not be a trivial factor, not a coincidence. It actually could be something that, that really matters in terms of, of behavior and risk, and evolution, I would say, as well. So if it were to affect behavior, we would assume it has to act beyond the skin. So we measured in the bloodstream of mice receiving very low doses of UV radiation if blood levels of endorphin would rise. And in fact, they do. You can see in the blue curve, whereas in P53 knockout mouse on the right, it does not go up predictably because P53 is the mediator of this effect. We also could measure pain thresholds because if this is reaching the brain and changing opiate type signaling, then the ability of that mouse that's received low dose UV radiation to sense pain or temperature, we measured a number of endpoints, um, would be altered and it would take a higher threshold. It would take a deeper pain or a longer, longer period of exposure to elevated temperature. And that's exactly what we saw as indicated in, these, in the graph at the top. But if we gave the opiate antagonist naloxone, which is the black curve at the bottom, it completely reversed this. So we could see an alteration in pain threshold upon UV irradiation, which was reversible with an opiate antagonist, suggesting that there was an endogenous opiate mediating this effect, and it correlated with elevations in beta endorphin. So we took a set of mice, we chronically UV irradiated them, and again, very low dose, because we didn't want to induce sunburning or, or inflammation in the skin. And then we abruptly, after about two weeks of once a day low dose UV irradiation, we suddenly gave naloxone, opiate receptor antagonist. And by virtually every measure of withdrawal symptoms, which pharmacologists and pain anesthesiologists look at all the time, these mice were addicted and having withdrawal symptoms. And so we could see clear evidence of behavioral consequences of UV, but the question remains, do they actually feel it? You know, obviously you can't ask the mice if they would feel it, but the way that it would matter, the manifestation of importance for humans, would be whether they would mod modify or modulate their behavior in response to cues to either gain or avoid some kind of a behavioral consequence associated with, with UV addiction. So we did this psychology experiment. We have one cage which is black on the inside and one cage which is white on the inside, and they have a little passageway between, and we can close the passageway off or we can open it up. So we have a set of mice, 50 mice or so, that have received low-dose UV irradiation for a couple of weeks, and on Monday, Half the mice are put in the black cage, half the mice are put in the white cage. And in each cage, the mice receive either naloxone, which would induce withdrawal symptoms, or saline as a control in both cages. And you close the door, and they must stay in that cage for one hour. So if they're having withdrawal symptoms, presumably they will associate it with the color of the cage. And after one hour, you open the door, they can go where they want. And on Tuesday, for one hour, same mice, same treatment, and on Wednesday, the same thing. So they've had three conditionings. 
And on Thursday, one by one, you take the mice, you open the doors, and put them into this two-cage contraption and ask, where do they go? And what you see is that the mice that receive naloxone are the only mice that will actually switch. So if they were white, they move to black. If they were black, they move to white. Unless they were beta endorphin knockout mice, in which case their distribution, like mice that had not been UV irradiated or had received saline, there was random distribution. So we could clearly see a choice. And the most important thing on Thursday, I forgot to say, they did not get naloxone on Thursday. They did not get UV on Thursday. All they got was a time to walk around the cage and see where they wanted to spend their time. So it was purely a psychological association. It's akin to, it's a beautiful Sunday, it's the middle of July, shall I go to the beach? Um, it's, it's a behavioral choice. And so they have made a behavioral choice. And, and so uh, we, we think that we're looking at something here that, that even, even in laboratory mice, even actually nocturnal animals, um, is having a behavioral, a very significant behavioral uh, measurable effect. I'm going to end with just a slide um, to point out something. My, my wife is a radiation oncologist, and she said to me, you know, radiation induces fatigue in the vast majority of patients, and it's highly debilitating, as you know. Is there any reason that shouldn't be inducing P53? Isn't it possible that's also inducing beta endorphin? So we did this study. This is actually a little crossover study you can see in the curve on the left, where we, uh, we, we gave fractionated radiotherapy to the tails of mice. We put them in a little lead chamber so that only the tail would stick out, and we gave fractionated radiation therapy, and we did a crossover um, with sham treatment or real radiation treatment. And we could see blood levels of endorphin would rise. They would not rise if um, the mice were P53 knockout. We could measure analgesic thresholds, similar to with UV. We could see that ionizing radiation did the same. But then we could look at fatigue. And the way you look at fatigue is with something called actimetry measurements. We were helped by some of the neuroscientists here at MGH, where you have a cage with 12 infrared beams and detectors, these paired, lined up. And every time the animal moves, it breaks a beam, and it's able to quantify movement. So you're just looking at movement as a surrogate for activity level. And as you can see in the blue curve, in the, in the blue um, bar graphs, that progressively these animals became incredibly lethargic. 50% loss of activity is actually tremendous. But the red curves show the same mice in the presence of naloxone, an opiate receptor antagonist, and it had completely reversed the effect. And so on the basis of this, we are about to open up a randomized trial of naltrexone versus placebo in radiation, in breast uh, cancer patients undergoing radiation therapy. We're actually going to be opening it up here and Dana-Farber, um, all coming from this observation that there is a beta endorphin pathway. And you might say, this is my final slide, is this a cruel joke that we would become addicted to the most ubiquitous carcinogen in the world, ultraviolet radiation. And we don't think so. We think this probably was a survival factor in human evolution, because as, my, as populations migrated away from the equator, where higher latitudes provided much less UV intensity, um, darker pigmentation was selected against, because the ability to synthesize vitamin D would be impinged on, and probably a behavioral inclination to get out of the cave and seek the sun for the 15 minutes that was there probably would have been life-saving against childhood rickets, childhood vitamin D deficiency that would almost certainly have been lethal pre-reproductive years, whereas melanoma, as lethal as it is, is not pre-reproductive years in the vast majority of cases. So we think this may be the origin of this, possibly is even the primordial human addiction. This may be you know, the, the place where addiction and opiate receptor signaling really entered into the world of human behavior for a good reason. Um, and one wonders about other conditions, uh, seasonal affective disorder and numerous psychiatric conditions that affect northern European populations. And so this is an, an area that, that we remain very interested in. So I will stop there. Just want to provide all the names of people who have done uh, this, this huge amount of work. And I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you. All right, David, so how do we protect from this endogenous, you know, rea reactive oxygen? Right, species so the endogenous reactive oxygen elevation that is present in, in the skin, and, and I would actually add, I don't believe that this is restricted to redheads. Redheads represent the model that we have. 
Um, I think most people who are Caucasian are closer to redheads in terms of their skin pigmentation than they are to, to non-Caucasian skin. Um, the exact details of that, there's actually remarkably little that's been studied about the precise pigment composition, but it clearly disconnects with hair color. Um, and there are plenty of, the majority of people who develop melanoma are not redheads, and many of them have dark hair like myself, but fair skin, poor tanning ability, and high melanoma risk. Um, so what, what would the solution be? Number one, as chairman of dermatology at Mass General, use sunscreen. <laughs> Um, this could be misinterpreted to imply that sunscreen has nothing to do with it, UV is irrelevant. That is definitely not the case. We suspect that the carcinogenicity of pheomelanin is probably further amplified, particularly by UVA, which also induces reactive oxygen species. These are certain wavelengths of UV, and even UVB as well. So sunscreen, absolutely important. Sun protection, absolutely important. But in addition to that, what we believe is that there is an opportunity to understand the chemistry of this ROS and identify antioxidants that perhaps should be part of these sunscreens or skin lotions and be able to help preserve the damage that otherwise would be happening. And you know, it's probably not restricted to cancer. Um, aging of white people's skin as compared to darkly pigmented people's skin is profoundly worse. I mean, it's it's. If you go, come to our clinic any day, you will see. I mean, in, in all manifestations from, from wrinkles to pigmented spots and, and numerous benign lesions, cosmetic uh, consequences, um, there is actually abundant evidence that these types of damage responses are occurring commonly. Um, and one could imagine that certain antioxidants will be able to attack this better than others. The, you know, the idea of you know, pour pomegranate juice on your skin and grape juice and that sort of thing, it, it, it's been popular to use antioxidants, but it's not been done carefully. And there's reason to suspect that in the wrong context, one man's antioxidant might even be pro-oxidant. So this is an area where we think there may be some opportunity. I have a, uh, a question um, from a kind of broad view, As someone who's just a clinician, I hear a, uh, I would say, one hopeful uh, approach to targeted therapy, which is to look at the apoptotic pathways, and there's a moment in time for these folks who are having near or, or complete responses to targeted therapy to then come in with uh, some of these anti-apoptotic pathway uh, drugs and really kind of push us over the edge, almost a cure. And then on the other side, there's the, these tumors are so heterogeneous that even if there's a 0.1% population of some pathway that is going to be getting you around that particular target inhibition, it doesn't matter, and, and everybody's going to develop uh, resistant disease. It's just a matter of time until you do. So uh, how do you reconcile, or do you think that it's the answer somewhere in the middle? I think the answer is, it's the old world of oncology. I remember studying this from my boards 150 years ago, which is it's some combination of dose intensity and treating at the point of lower tumor volume, tumor burden. So I, be I believe that, in, that these combination studies should be carried out in the population of patients where we can assess it quickly, and then they should be brought in the adjuvant setting as quickly as, as possible. Um, and because it's math, and you know the microscopic only disease is orders of magnitude less, um, and the fact is that that's where cures, combination chemotherapy, radiation therapy have cured breast. I mean, I, we use the example of breast all the time, um, and other diseases where adjuvant has worked, where in the in the stage four context it does not work. They're, they're really and and in diseases that may be very similar to melanoma in terms of genomic complexity and heterogeneity and instability. So that, that would be my, my twinge of optimism in this. David, could you just uh, sketch a little bit more detail the clinical trial you're doing or thinking about doing in the radiation-induced fatigue syndrome, please? Yeah. The, uh, so this study, the, the design is um, to monitor patients uh, with their, their very, the fatigue field is incredibly, incredibly mature, as a matter of fact. There are nurses who have generated these questionnaires that have been validated in many different contexts, not all cancer contexts even, but heavily um, validated in cancer as well. 
Um, what we do is, prior to radiation, they will receive baseline screening. They will then uh, undergo weekly screening. It can even be done by phone, so they don't have to be, you know, it's, it's not a special visit or anything. Um, once they hit a threshold um, that is determined, quantified, you know, that they have now, you know, crossed a threshold of, of self-reported fatigue, um, at that point they would be randomized to naltrexone, which is an opiate receptor antagonist, or placebo. Um, and they will continue that for four weeks and continue with weekly monitoring by questionnaire. Um, it's a very simple, we, we spent a lot of time, should it be a prevention study, should it be a treatment study? Um, if if you, you did not ask me how do we think elevations in beta endorphin cause fatigue, um, I don't think these people are opiate toxic. I think we would have known that if that were the case. My, my hunch would be that there is a disruption of circadian rhythms and that basically the surges of endorphin that may follow their radiation, whatever time of day it is, it's variable, it's not following the circadian rhythm that their body is expecting. And so it's more of a disruption than an induction of fatigue, per se, and, and that fatigue may be that. That's at least a, a hypothesis that we have. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much, David.